Hi, hello, good day, and welcome back. So this is going to be our last section on the object, Java objects. But before we leave it, we need to try and understand a little bit more about objects. In the previous video, we saw how to use objects and we have basic introduction to objects. But here, we're going to take a deeper dive into all objects seems to just be everywhere. And almost everything is an object. Not quite, but almost. So let's take, let's jump in. Okay, so let's take a look here. Um, on line two, I have a variable i, and it's assigned to um, number four. And then on line three, I print out not only what i is, but the type. And you can see on line 29, along the bottom there, uh, it says that the, the, the i is four and the type is a number. That's fine. Now, if, what I want to show is that this i, whatever i is, a number, is not an object. Because if I say i that too cool and try to add a property to it, uh, you'll see when I try to print out, uh, retrieve that value of that property um, on line 8, and I print it out there on line 31, you'll see it's how it says it's undefined, which means that well, we were unsuccessful in adding the property too cool to this variable i. So i is indeed not an object. Even though Java compiles com correctly, it just didn't give us the expectation we want. So there are a few things that are not objects. And here, you can see this one says it was a number. Now, uh, let's go on further. And on line 11, I create something that is a number. I said new, but I use a new operator, which I'm going to cover a little bit later. And I say, um, give me this thing a new one or another or instantiate rather is the correct way of saying instantiate an object of the type number and I want to use the value four and here I could see it though it says it's an object and it looks exactly like when we create an object right where we did we talked about object the last time is just open um, curly braces and cold curly brace that you use and so it looks just like that that's the value of it and which is kind of strange you're probably expecting four but it says that it's an object and we're able on line 17 to add a property to it, and we can get it back out on line 18, which you see that that's printed out um, there on um, line 36, right? Um, and so this is the yet though it's an object. Um, but the other thing we can do is we can say, well, if i really is a number, um, can I do a numeric operation with it? And so if I say i plus 5 and i is a number, then I should be able to get 5. And there's um, i, I plus five is to get nine. And that's exactly what we see printed out on line 38. And when I try to create another object that is a string, and we can see it is an object because it says it's an object, um, when I add five to that, that behaves like a string. So you can have two things that are both objects, but because they're different types of objects, they behave differently. Now to understand this, how two things can both be objects, but still operate, they behave very differently when you try to do operations on them. Let's turn to classification. So here you see I have this chart and I'm showing a very simple class hierarchy and it's animal and then the very generic type or class and then more specific instances or grouping of how things can probably be subdivided in that class or in that group and it's subgroups and dog, cats and humans. And you understand very well that even though all these might share common traits that make them animal, when you look at them individually, they're very things that are specific to each that cause them to be for the, um, go into their own categories. And they are things that you might be able to also ask, ask a dog to do that you cannot ask of a cat or expect of a cat and vice versa, you know, with humans and so on. And so it's the same, that's the reason why when we created this object number, we're able to perform numeric operation on it because it's more specific I'm just being an object. Yes, it's an object, it's true, but it's more than an object, right? And same thing with string. String is also an object. You can add properties to it. So the number and the string share that in common that they both behave like object. But uh, more specifically, they both can also de behave, you know, as either a numeric value or a string value. And so let's take a look at that in a little bit more details when it comes to our types in JavaScript. So here you can see the same thing. So I have this very generic class or higher grouping called objects. And then within that, I could further subdivide things into numbers, string, arrays, which you've seen, functions, and data, and their others, right? And so that's why 
you know I created a number and a string and I asked what type it is, it said it was an object. It would be nice if it says, hey, this is a number or whatever, but that's what it said. And so we can treat it like an object, but then we can also treat it like the specific thing it is. What does this mean? Well, um, when you have a type or a class classification, um, that's just a broad category. That's the thing that describe what um, instances of that type can do or how they should behave, right? We have a certain expectation from a dog and so on. Uh, but it just having the class dog or the category dog doesn't mean you have a dog. It's just the description of thing animals that participate in that grouping, how they should be. A specific dog would be some dog Rex or the dog Max, for example, right? Um, or dog, whatever dog name you, you like, right? Um, see, so the other day I met a dog around here who was called Chocolate, right? Because um, he was brown. Anyway, so, and then the same thing with number. Um, instance, we could have this broad category called number, there's a class for it, but um, very specific instance is would be called it would be like the example we have five or a variable a containing a numeric value. Uh, same thing with strings. Now notice I have instance slash object because depending on who you talk to and which language background they're coming from, people might actually say I have an instance of a class, which means an ex uh, an a particular thing that I'm talking about that came from that participate or have the behavior defined by this class, or they might say I have an object of a class, which would be like Rex or something, or some, might, some people might say we have an instant object or object instance. So all those are all correct. And to confuse matter even further, Java, Java and JavaScript actually have object as a class type, right? A way of grouping things. And so that makes it a little bit um, harder, but to kind of draw the lines, but the more you use it, you, it's, you're going to sort it out. So just know that though, there's the idea of a class that defines and say what is allowed, and then when you say instant and object, we're talking about a specific occurrence of that thing, okay? And don't let the fact that you might also have a class called an object, as in the case of Java when we saw in the previous class diagram, how you had number as a class classification, a way of classifying a set of variable types or something, and that is um, with a subtype of object, okay? Um, that's just Java and JavaScript doing that silly thing. That's probably not too clear, so let's make this a little bit more concrete. Let's say I have a recipe, a cake recipe. I can't eat the cake recipe. I have to go through some process of utilizing that cake recipe before I can actually have a cake. So the cake recipe tells me how I can get a cake, what I need to do in order to have the cake that which is what I want. So too is you can think of class versus the instance. So when I have a class, it is sort of like the recipe. It's the details about what this thing is, what's inside of it, how it can behave. And then you have to go through some preparation and in programming, or at least in Java, JavaScript, you use the new keyword, which is your preparation that takes, oh, when I say new on this recipe, it gives me an actual instance. So the more often I use new on that same exact recipe, I can get more instances. Just like if I, I take the same one cake recipe, no matter how many times I go through the preparation, I'll still get cakes. I don't in any way use up the recipe. The re recipe is not depleted in any way, no matter how many times I use it. And same, so too is when you have this idea of a class in programming. And so if we want to create a new object, we can use the object class and say new on it and we get a new object. And if you look at one of the ways I show you that you can, the formal way of creating an object is to say new, or the formal way of creating an array is to say new. Just like we saw the formal way of creating a number was to say new. But you can also just use the shortcut for array, which is the square bracket, or the curly braces to you know, create an object. And that's just shortcut, or they call it syntactic sugar. But behind the scenes, you can imagine that all new is being run for you. Okay, so I hope that makes sense. And so here's a gain, you know, uh, example of, of that where you can use these shortcuts for, um, you know, creating instances of things. And so, for example, if I write a function, um, I could create more instances of that same function by saying new on it, right? Because the function, when I create a function foo or I write a function foo, it's just a recipe for what could, should be done if this function is called. And we've seen that how you can use the function without actually doing new on it. Um, but 
we're not going to get into that. But just know so you, I can still say new on that particular function and create more instances of it. But one of the things I wanted to show you is um, to help you better understand objects over openly is that if R is an object, of course I can add properties to it. But I want to show you the effect of adding, adding properties to an array and how does that affect the array itself. And so let's say we created an uh, empty array and you could see I have two ways to do that. I could say new on that array or I can just use the shortcut or this um, syntactic sugar online tree. Remember they're both the same way thing and I printed out to show you uh, the result and you could see output 30 and line th on 30 and 32, exact same thing, right? Um, and so what about if I say on line 10, I'm going to add a property to this, uh, several properties actually. Um, and so I have multiple ways of adding properties. We talked about that in the last video, number 38. And so you can see when I print that array out now, what it looks like, okay? And not only that, um, you can see what I printed out on line 35. It shows that uh, uh, what it looks like is that there are key value pairs on that array. But the length of the array is still zero. So even though I added a number of properties to it, I did not actually change the length of the array, which means I didn't add elements to the array. I add properties to the array, and that's where you see there, okay? And so I can always access those properties just like if, uh, with the indexing method, just like I did on line 12, right? When I say, you know, in parentheses, or even on line 10 and 11. Now, and that look like any other object that we covered from the last video. But what if I actually want to affect the elements contained in the array? Well, I could say array index zero takes an object. In this case, I assign an object, but I could assign anything. We talk about this. You can put objects in arrays and arrays in objects and keep nested and going forever crazy. And now you can see when I print that back out, it looks like if, um, you know, I, I, I have two different things. I have these singular values that are separated by comma, but I also have these key value pairs that are separated by color, commas. And it's all printed out together, but you could see the difference. And not only that, um, I, the length is a property of that array, and I can affect it. I, not only can I read it, but I can assign to it. And of course, if I assign to it, um, it's, it's, I can grow and shrink the array just by uh, manipulating the length of it. So if you had an array with a thousand elements and you want to truncate it to 500, and you don't want to just go delete, delete, or splice where we did the last time, some of those array, array um, operation, just assign you know the size you want to the length property and you will tr truncate the array if you want to grow an array but have all the elements be empty you can certainly do that and so you can see that example there Same with this idea of you can always add properties to an object and to follow up on what i mentioned earlier about a function and how i can create a function and then create instances of it because that function is like a is a type um you know a class and it represents a recipe sort of um, so you see I have this function foo and I have some variables and I have a number of ways of accessing. So I have a var local variable, then I actually create properties on this function by saying this. I haven't explained the this keyword, but uh, trust me, this just means <laughs> what's happening inside this function. It's a reference or a handle to this same, the function that we're in. And I know that's some recursive, but just accept it and, 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 and said that, no, that's what it is. And so this that read local is like I'm adding the property read local to the function foo and set local is I'm adding a property whose value is a function called, um, you know, uh, it's called set local and I'll take a, a variable value in and then I'll assign it to the local variable so I could change it, okay? And so from outside, since foo has these two properties, um, actually three properties, read local, set local, and get local, I should be able to use foo and access those properties, but guess what? Local is a variable. It's inside the function, it's hidden, it's encapsulated. You cannot get to it as a property. It is not a property. The only of the function, the only thing that are properties of that function are the ones that are attached to this. And I can either do it this way when I create the function, or I can actually create the function and then create the property on it. So read local, set local, and get local are no different then on line 21, when I create an instance of that function and put it in F, and then I say F that my name. The only difference though is that my instance F has the three properties that the function foo already gave it because it was created from foo. And then now F has this extra property called my name. F2 on the other hand, doesn't, uh, does not have the extra property my name because it only got the tree 
that um, that came from um, the foo function. And so, um, if I wanted to make new instances of foo have additional property, I would have to add those property onto foo itself. And then after I create, um, you know, new, then those things would have have it. But if I do new before I add uh, any property to foo, then yeah, those, those instances would have it. And that kind of makes sense, right? I mean, if you're using the recipe, a recipe I gave you to make some cake, a cake, and then afterward I change the recipe, it doesn't go back and change the cake you already made. It just makes sense that if you want the new benefits of my updated recipe, you have to redo your cake using my new recipe. I hope that kind of makes sense. But I think it's, it's kind of intuitive when you think of the recipe as the class or the template and then using new or the preparation um, to produce the any number of um, objects or instances that you can manipulate or entities that you can actually manipulate. And so just to close, objects are awesome. Sometimes a little bit confusing, but just trust me, use them and you're gonna eventually, there's no substitute for playing with it and using it. And eventually you're just gonna get it, right? Um, I could try and break it down as much as possible, but eventually certain things you just can't break down any further. And you just have, there's no substitute for just playing with it and using it. And then it, it's just gonna bing, like a light comes on. Um, and it's still, they're still very flexible, all right? So that's it for objects. Um, if you still have questions, do, even though I said, oh, there's only so far I could break it down, I would love to attempt to show it to you different ways and show you more examples. So if you still have questions, just let me know in the comments and I'll do just that. Until then, though, have fun, keep programming, keep learning.